What we're going to talk about today is the, or give the proof of, of the recursion theorem that I mentioned last time. So the recursion theorem allows us to define functions with domain as the natural numbers and whose range is some set. Often we're going to just define functions from natural numbers to natural numbers. And as I indicated last time, the prime examples are arithmetic addition, multiplication, and exponentiation. But actually the theorem works for defining functions uh, whose domain is the natural numbers from some starting point. So I'll send zero will be sent to some starting point. And then thereafter, there's some given function that tells us how to go from h of k to h of k plus one. So let's look again at the theorem and then we'll give its proof. So the recursion theorem here on omega. <clears throat> so again, this is all going to be coming pretty much verbatim from the notes. And we're on page 21 there of the notes. So we start with any set, which is going to be the range of our function we're going to define. We pick as a data on our starting point, some little a, a member of the set, and we're given a function from a to a. So then there is supposed to be a unique function h, which we say is defined through recursion. h of zero is a, and for any n, h of, in this we call now n plus one, is f of h of n. So if I've got h of n defined, this tells me how to define h of n plus one. So, and the picture then is, one starts off with a, and one has f of a, and f of f of a, and so on. So the first thought that people have is, you know, well, what could go wrong, right? Do we have to prove this? Well, we're trying to bring into existence an infinite object, this function h. And, when we start talking about infinite objects, we have to be careful, right? Where they've come from, are we justified in saying that they exist? So in any case, we can prove that there is such a function and it's unique. There can't be two functions satisfying these two clauses here. And this is, as I've said earlier, this is going to be mirrored exactly when we come to define ordinal arithmetic. We're going to have a recursion function, recursion theorem, definable on ordinals, transfinite ordinals, not just the ordinal omega here. So we can regard this as a kind of warm up for what's coming next. Uh, the proof is, so again, surprisingly complicated right, for uh, what we all think of as being something quite obvious. Well, Proving the obvious is not always uh, trivial. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to go pretty much verbatim through what's in the notes here. <clears throat> so the strategy is to define this H through approximations, through finite approximations. So proof of the recursion theorem. So the strategy is we define H through a sequence of approximations. So I say finite approximations. And H will be the union of these approximations. And the approximations, well, being approximations, they have to be defined 
has little pieces of H. So we'll, so let's say define U here is, a, now I'll say a K approximation. And I'm going to abbreviate that as just by a prox. If three things hold. So U is a set, it has to be a function. It's, sorry, I am quite finished with A, and its domain is K. E. K is non zero. Then U, then zero is in its domain, and U of zero equals A. So recall that K is the set of its predecessors here. So if K is bigger than zero, right? zero is in the domain of k. So then u of zero matches up what we want h of zero to be. If k is bigger than the successor of n, or n plus one, then u of the successor of n Again, has to be defined in the same way that our intentions are for H. H, the successor of N, is F of H of N. So we'll do the same thing. U of S of N better be F of U of N. Okay. So in other words, U here in these clauses just satisfies the same two clauses that H does. This one and two that are up here, let me call these star. So that's why U is an approximation to, to H. So U satisfies star without requiring that the domain of U is omega. In fact, we say the domain of U is an element of omega here. Okay, so we can give some kind of concrete examples. So this here, this is a one approximation. Why do I say that? Okay, one is bigger than zero here. Zero is in the domain here and we have this ordered pair, zero is paired off with A. So actually this is just a little function. It's a function with just one element in its domain and it returns A. That's just what we want here. So again, recall one is just zero. Okay. So we say the domain is one, that means it's only predecessor is actually an element of the domain. Okay, so one could go on like this. So this will be a two approximation. Do you mind moving the page up, please? Sorry, thank you. 
This is a two approximation. Again, recall two is zero, one. So it has to be a function. Its domain has to be two. So it has to have zero and one in the domain. This is required by the first clause. And this is what we must have by the second clause of star. The U of one must be <coughs> F of A. And actually our old friend, the empty set here, this is a zero approximation. Because I can always regard the empty set as the function with the empty domain. Well, zero is that empty, you know, that is the empty domain here. So we can consider this as a zero approximation if we want here. Now I want to consider approximations of different lengths for different k's and l's. I'll just informally call k here the length of the approximation u. So if u is a k approximation, and I pick a number less than or equal to k, then I can shorten u to l here, and then, then this is an L approximation. So I can think of the approximation as being a sequence of points like this. Yeah. <clears throat> so I've got U0, U1, and so on. And here, this is U K minus one. Okay. So this is my U. So I'm sorry, I've gone again. All right. So U is my K approximation. It's called. Sorry, Philip, there's a weird tapping sound as you're speaking. I don't know if you're hitting the mic or something. It's oh. quite distracting. So. Right, thank you. I think it's a pen rolling around on my desk. I've moved it now. Let me know if it's still there. Let me know if it comes back. Thank you. No, good, good, good you say it. So U here is, it's got K elements in its domain. It's a K approximation. If I pick a number L, I can just shorten U to be an L approximation. If this is U of L minus one here. So then this much becomes an L approximation. That's the content of two, little Roman two here. So I can always shorten approximations, but also I can always add on one more element to make it a bit longer. <clears throat> Suppose u is a k approximation. Okay, and then so there's some value here to this. Let's call it c. All right, so this is something or other, this is some point also in a. Right. Then how would I, I might like to extend this approximation one more. I'd like to make it into a k plus one approximation. K plus one approximation. I call it U prime. And I just take U and then I add on what the next ordered pair has to be according to those original rules. Well, it's going to have to have K in its domain and it's going to have to give me back F of C. 
right? So that is f of u k minus one will be, um, so u prime here of k ends up being f of u of k minus one. Yeah. So I hope that's, that plays a role in what's to come. I hope that's okay. I extend it one more by putting on what I have to put on according to the rule star to make it one, one thing longer. So I can always extend an approximation. One more point. Okay, so the rest of the proof now over the page on page 22 is uh, some properties of U and how we define H. Properties of approximations and how we define H. So the first thing which we've sort of alluded to more or less already, but if U is a K approximation and V is a K prime approximation, and let's suppose K is less than or equal to K prime, so V is potentially longer than U here, then actually if I restrict V to K, I cut it down from length K prime to length K, actually it's U, it can't be anything else. So one way of saying this is that approximations must agree on the common parts of their domain. So U as a set of ordered pairs is a subset of V. So we'll justify this. Yeah, hope everybody's got that. Okay, I was just looking at the chat. So maybe I've stopped um, the pen rolling. Is the tapping gone? Yeah. Yeah, Thank you. good. Yeah, it was, of course, here I, I, of course, I don't hear it. It's just a slight movement of the pen, but it was right next to the mic. Okay, good. Okay, so here, here would be the picture then. Here's U and here's V. Right. So length K, length K prime. So one is just saying, if I cut V down to this point, V agrees with U. These are the same. So suppose this isn't the case. So they must agree, disagree at some point. So we pick some M in the domain of U, let M be least, such that U of M is different from V of M. After all, if these are different, they have to disagree somewhere. And it's by induction, as it were, finite induction. It can't be, M can't be zero because the definition of being an approximation means U of zero is A, which is V of zero. M is not zero. 
since u of zero equals a equals v of zero by definition of being an approximation. This is by clause B here, what it means to be an approximation. So M is a successor of something. It's not zero, it's a successor of something. We've shown that everything in omega is, well, we know everything in omega, it's either zero or the successor of something. Now M is least where they differ. So on M prime, they agree. So we must have that u of m prime equals v of m prime. But now again by b, right? What then is uh, u of m? Well, it's f of u of m prime. Substituting in likes for likes, this is f of v of m prime, but by definition of v being an approximation, this is v of m. So this is nonsense because we chose m such that u and v were different on m. Contradiction. So there is no such M where they differ. So that finishes one. So that little argument says approximations must agree on their domain. And actually it's the same argument is going to show that our final function H is uniquely defined. Recall the statement of our theorem is not just that there exists an H, but there exists exactly one H. So exactly the same proof shows uh, two here. So the uniqueness of our desired function H. So we haven't shown it exists yet, so we'll just say if it exists. If H exists, then it's unique. And I'm almost tempted not to do this because it's exactly the same argument as before. Instead of talking about uh, uh, a U and a V, We'll talk about a function h and another function h prime. Suppose h and h prime are two different functions. With domain omega satisfying the clauses of the theorem. There's going to be a least point of difference if they're because we're assuming they're different. Now I basically write out the same same bit again. But instead of choosing an M between zero and K, I just choose an M between zero and omega. So it's least natural number so that H of M is different from H prime of M. Okay. 
And you can see it's going to go exactly the same way. Again, m is not zero. So m equals, again, the successor of some m prime. And now instead of u and v, I write h in h prime. The leastness of m means h of m prime is h prime of m prime. And now I write equivalent of this line here, this line here. So h of m is f of h of m prime, but this is the same as h prime of m prime here. And this is h prime of m. And again, I get my contradiction coming out here. So really, I could have gotten away with just saying, by the same reasoning as in part one, we deduce that h prime h must be must h is unique if it exists. Okay, so now we have to justify existence, and this is three. Such an H exists. So two shows there can't be more than one such H and three shows that there exists an H. Okay, and this is the harder part of the, this is the harder part of the argument here. <clears throat> so I'll define the collection B of approximations. of all k approximations for all k. So I don't mean a fixed length, all of the approximations, all the finite approximations. Now we, we've seen that any two, any two approximations agree on the common parts of their domain. of their two domains. And I think I even wrote up at the top here under one, I've got two approximations. The shorter one is a subset of the longer one. I just consider those ordered pairs, sets of ordered pairs. So what we're going to do is just take the union of all of these approximations, the union of B, big union of B. And basically that's going to be a chain of approximations like this that will, which are included in each other. So I just take the union of the lot. So for any u and v in b, either u is a subset of v or vice versa. So by the axiom of unions, union of b here is a set. Excuse me? Yes. Uh, how can we be sure that B is a set? And yeah, not a very class? good, very good. Yeah, you're very fast. Yes, I haven't, I'm sweeping that under the carpet, right? I don't know yet that B is a set, right? And in fact, we won't really know that B is a set until we discuss the axiom of replacement later on in the, in the course. 
Okay. So okay. I need a footnote here. I was just about to say it, but you jumped in. Sorry. If if we know that B is a set. Okay, so we'll talk about that later. But this is this is the trick: is we take B and we take the union. So union of B, but the point is that this is our H, right? And the rest of the proof is just showing that H is what we want. We, we want to show that it's a function and it's got domain omega. Well, being H is a set of ordered pairs because everything in B is a set of ordered pairs. The only thing is there might be two clashing ordered pairs that stop this from being a function. It might somehow become multivalued. Some element gets taken to two different objects in two different approximations. Well, we already know that approximations agree on the common parts of their domain. So basically that's what we say here. If H were not a function, well, let's suppose I've got N and C and N and D. Suppose these are in, in H. Again, thinking of H as a collection of ordered pairs, it better be that C equals D. Suppose C was different from D. Then I've got two different approximations. We've got two approxim approximations, U and V in B, doing different things to N. Sorry, V here of N equals D. But two approximations by one, they must agree on the common parts of their domains, right? So this is impossible by one here. So H is going to be a function. And lastly, we want it to have domain omega. I don't want somehow for it to be too short. Okay, so I want to justify that. Okay, so suppose uh, with this set X is non empty. It's the set of natural numbers where N is not in domain of H. We'd like X to be empty and then domain H is omega. So suppose it's not empty. So So by definition of H, what does this mean as well? It means that X is also the set of natural numbers here. So there's no approximation U with N in domain U. Can you move the page up? Sure. There's no approximation U within in the domain of U. Well, I justified at the beginning that there is, after all, a one approximation.
Right, so this was note, this was note little Roman one up here. So, so zero is not the least element of X. If X is going to be non-empty, its least element is a successor. So suppose N zero is a successor of some M is the least element of X. So this means M itself is not an element, sorry, as M is not an element of X, because N zero is the least element of X, So there must be an N0 approximation U with U does sign something to M, call it C, whatever C is. Right? Right, so the picture is, I mean, here's zero, right? Um, here's M and here's the successor of M. Right. So I got an approximation, an N zero approximation. So remember U then has in its domain, if it's an N0 approximation, all the numbers up to and including M. Yeah. But we saw above how to extend an approximation one more place. So we saw at three above exactly what to do to extend U to make it an N zero plus one approximation. U together with just one more ordered pair, N zero, and we apply F to what it must be here. Yeah. This then is an N zero plus one approximation. Right, or S of N zero, if I'm still being pedantic and keeping to the S function. Is that a one in the brackets of the F? Here, here, this uh, is a C. It's a C. This was the value of U of M. So, to get the next value in my series, I apply F to the previous value. So in this thing here, I call this U prime. U prime of N zero here is F of C, which is just F of U of M. And this, this here being the successor of M. So this is the contradiction because we assumed N zero was the least element of X, right? And that would mean there's no approximation with N zero in its domain, but we just constructed one, this U prime. So this is a contradiction. So X is empty 
and the domain of H is omega. And that was the only thing we had left to show. So that finishes the theorem. Okay, uh, are there any questions here? Right. So, so what, what was the part about the one approximation? The one approximation? Yeah, when you said um, there is a one approximation. So when I was introducing the idea of different approximations, right? Um, the, I gave an example. This is a one approximation. It's the only thing it can be. I could have said the one approximation, but I didn't really want to spend time justifying the fact that all one approximations are the same, because later on we're going to justify that all k approximations are the same. But this is what it has to be, because if it's to be approximation, it has to satisfy the first clause of what we want h to be like. h of zero is a, so u of zero is a. So this is a this just a single ordered pair is a one approximation. So how is that used in the in the proof? In the proof, um, right? We saw that there was a one approximation. So that says zero is not in X. That's how we're using it because X is the set of natural numbers for which there is no approximation u with n in its domain. Well, zero is not in here because there is a one approximation which has got zero in its domain. So zero is not in x. And that's what I'm saying here. Zero is not the least element of x. Oh, uh, okay, thank you. Okay, all right. Anyone else? Okay. Um, yes, do, do learn that. Um, it's going to be the basis of a recursion theorem on ordinals later. And you'll see the same moves being made later on. Okay, so we saw uh, also yesterday, how to define the arithmetical functions given the recursion theorem. So I won't go over those again. Those were the examples at the bottom of page 22. So we defined these a alpha functions here. A alpha of, sorry, better jumping ahead to ordinals, a n of m and m n of m and e n of m. Using the recursion theorem last time. So review those. Proposition 217 lists some basic properties of natural numbers. Let me see if I can get this in reasonable focus there. So these laws of arithmetic are entirely familiar. Here we have the associative law. So again, you may just think it's obvious adding two plus three 
and then five is the same as adding two to three plus five. But again, we can prove this. We don't have to take these things on trust or just say they're obvious. And then various other laws, commutative law for addition, commutative law for multiplication, distributive law, law for exponents. And now the proofs of all of these laws are proofs by induction. So as an example of one in the notes here, I'll do a different one. And an exercise will ask you to prove some of these other clauses here. So, I mean, there's two, two things to note here. If an induction has got three variables in it, here, if a statement has got three variables in, my tip is always to do induce or do the induction on the last variable. It's on the P that occurs here, the third named variable. So do again, do the induction here on P. So again, this amounts to proving it when P equals zero and going from when P equals K to P equals K plus one. And when you do the proof, you can, for the sake of the exercise, say you can always assume if you want to prove F, you can assume you've already proven A to E. So you can rely upon the previous, previous clauses. So let's do one of those. Let's finish off by doing one of these. Um, yeah. So let me pick one. You pick one that's not actually in the notes. Right? So I, we do C as a sample, let's do D. And what does D say here? D says M times N times P is M times N times P. So these are not difficult. It's just a question if you've not seen them set out before, how do you set it out? So as I say, do the induction. You don't have to do it this way. There are many ways of doing this, but do the induction on the last variable that appears, so P. So this is my, my hint or tip. Do the induction on the last named variable. It's just my rule of thumb for making it easy. So P equals zero. So we just check that our definitions enable this to work. Well, what is N times zero? This is M times zero, because by the definition of the multiplying by N function, this is this. Okay, so this is, this is uh, again zero, but this is again also m times n times zero here. And I'm here, I'm applying the multiply by the m times n function. That's my justification there, just for the base cases. Assume true for P equals K. Okay. So I assume I know that M times N times K is M times N times K. So we look at M times N times K plus one, right? And I want K plus one, K plus one here in these points. 
So let's see. This is um, m times, and well, what is this? This is m times k plus n. Yeah. And here, so this I've used the multiply by n function to justify this. If you look at what n times k plus one is, it's this. And now what do I want to say? I want, I'll use the associative law or multiplication, which is D in my list here, plus N here. So I've got that around um, to be this. Um, and now I use the multiply by the M times N function to say that this is the same as um, m times n times k plus one. There. And this is what we wanted. I've now got the clause with k replaced by k plus one. or p equals k plus one. So this is how you would set out um, a justification of uh, a clause like this. Okay, so I slightly over time. Is there any, any questions there? I can just put the paper down again. Sorry. Explain how you get the last line again, please. This last line? Yeah. Um, what I'm using is um, the rule that M times uh, oh, sorry, I, I, I've, I've messed up. I should have used the distributive law. Let's put that in here. Uh, this would be C. So I justified this by using C. Yeah. And this should be M times N. So associative law, move the brackets over. Now I use this function here. So I'm using here, you know, that. Um, um, M times Q, K plus one is um, M Q K plus Q, or in other words, Q times K plus Q. So I'm using this rule with Q as M times N. Sorry, yes, I skipped over that. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions there? Okay, fine. Well, let's call it a day then.